Hey, welcome back everyone. This is going to be my first video on Freyrin. I'm only able to record this because it's only about one fight because I am still pretty busy with work. And when I do get like a couple of offs, I'll start with the Freyrin episode one to four analysis. Before I get into the staff breakdown or analyzing the content itself, I just want to start by talking about the outbreak that Jujutsu Kaisen fans are having saying like Freyrin stole all of our animators and other dumb shit like that. I'm not really surprised because, you know, this is just how the anime fandom is progressing as well. They are gaining more knowledge about Sakuga and just the staff behind the anime little by little. Shonen fans have gained the ability to read the staff names and put two and two together, but they still don't understand the inner workings of the anime industry and why something like this Freyren action sequence is possible. So basically saying that Fukushi stole animators from Sashimo is like wrong on multiple levels. It pretty much boils down to point one being like the production bottleneck that anime have. I think Kevin had written about this on Sakuga blog a while ago, if I can find this, which I'm pretty sure it does exist. I put it in the description. Please do read it. It's highly informative. And even ignoring production bottlenecks, it would still be stupid to say this because the shonen fans who started following Sakuga with Jujutsu Kaisen don't realize that these animators worked on stuff before Jujutsu Kaisen as well. Koki Fujimoto has like made a switch. Like he was a main animator for Jujutsu Kaisen. Now apparently he's going to be working for Freyrin, which does add up because he's done a single sequence for Jujutsu Kaisen season two so far. But Koki Fujimoto has always been that kind of a guy. He used to be the main animator for My Hero Academia. He made a lot of highlights for season three and season four, but from season five onwards, he disappeared and he joined Jujutsu Kaisen and Chainsaw Man where he was a main animator. And his absence was definitely felt for My Hero Academia. These animators are freelancers at the end of the day. They are associated with names of people, not names of studios. It is never a necessity for them to work on one project and one project on its own. Depending on what their contract says, if they have the leeway to help out on other projects, they will. For example, Koki Fujimoto himself, while he was the main animator for Jujutsu Kaisen and Chainsaw Man, still animated one sequence for the premiere of Mob Psycho Season 3 because of the association he has with Bone Studio B, as he was the main animator for Super Crooks. And that is the same thing that's happening with Keichiro Watanabe here. He was able to make two cuts for pre reign even though he's a main animator for Jujutsu Kaisen Season 2. It does not mean that we are not going to get like a Keichiro Watanabe sequence ever on Jujutsu Kaisen Season 2 at all or anything. No, it's just that as a practitioner of full animation, making extremely complicated looking sequences, it takes a lot of time for him to animate said sequences. Another thing to note is that Jujutsu Kaisen does not really have a shortage of names at all. That's the last thing this project is suffering from. You need time and you need talent, Jujutsu Kaisen does not have a shortage of talent. It just have a shortage of time. I mean, just look at the Netflix Castlevania series. It's not succeeding because of the sheer quantity of high level names associated with it. No, it's succeeding because of a medium sized, tightly linked group of animators who get plenty of time to animate multiple sequences and complete their work. And that is also how Yuichiro Fukushi operates. He's connected with pretty much all the big names in the industry. Connections lead to more connections and good production conditions result in those connections wanting to stick around. Now getting into the episode, while I am only going to specifically focus on the fight sequence, I will also talk about the episode generally. It had top tier artwork, but it was not, let's say, trying to be more ambitious than the other Freyrin episodes. That's not to say that this episode is bad. That's just saying that all Freyrin episodes have been incredible so far. But the big Sabunga moment Moment was just the fight sequence. And I guess that's how Freyrin as a project is going to be. It's not going to peak in episodes. Instead, Freyrin is going to maintain an above average quality floor while having peaks of industry leading animation. Now let's talk about the names attached to this fight sequence. So this episode was storyboarded and directed by Toru Iwazawa. Toru is a skilled Utapon inspired animator. This is his debut as an episode director. As far as connections go, he's very closely associated with Tatsuya Yoshihara because Toru was one of the most important people working on Black Clover. He's also very close friends with Kai Shibata. They've worked together on multiple occasions. Ezawa also works in close association with Hironori Tanaka. He's appeared in multiple Tanaka episodes. The most important connection that he has though, as far as binding him to the Fukushi team and Madhouse as a whole goes, is with fellow animator Reiko Nagasawa. And that's because Toru Ezawa is married to Reiko Nagasawa. Reiko started off as an in-between animator for Madhouse projects. Later on, that became a little bit more focused to the Fukushi Madhouse projects. Until eventually, she made her character design debut with Tucked Up Destiny. And since this was her first major role beyond 
in between animation and key animation, Toru also pitched in for this project with his first major role as the action director of Tucked Up Destiny. Tucked was an incredibly produced show as far as the Madhouse episodes go, the Mappa episodes not so much. Toru also storyboarded episode 3 of Tucked Up Destiny, the first few minutes of which is the best action sequence of the whole show. And here you'll get what kind of a director or action director Toru Ibazawa is. His Yutaka Nakamura inspiration extends over just his animation, it seeps into his directorial skills as well. Most importantly, if you're Utapon inspired, you need to have a very good understanding of scale, which Thoru did brilliantly. This is also thanks to the animators who worked on this scene who were also like mostly Utapon inspired. This is the first major work of EN. So we have an extremely skilled action animator with a large number of connections with the industry who takes inspiration from the best action animator of all time storyboarding this fight scene. And that is great because this fight scene is the perfect canvas for animators to just absolutely flex everything that they're capable of to make a bombastic sequence. Because animating a small character or a group of characters fighting against an extremely large enemy is like the perfect canvas for Sakuga animators to show off. Way too many examples for me to share. Off the top of my head, Shingo Yama scene from Yozakura Quartet, Arifumi Mai's Levi vs Beast Titan, the finale of Castlevania season 4, the extraordinary spectacle that was Sakazume's Princess Reconnect episode 4. As long as you have the numbers in Sakuga animators, you can make one such scene a masterpiece and numbers Fukushi provided to Toru Iwazawa. Toru Iwazawa probably just listed out, these are the friends I want to work with here and Fukushi was like, alright homie, I got you. This I would say was also necessary in the specific case because most of these people are busy with other projects. So they can only afford to animate like a couple of cuts if they want to maintain the quality of those cuts as well. This feels less like how traditional anime is produced and more like how, you know, the Fate Grand Order CMs are produced or like video games trailers are produced which is pretty much like an amalgamation of the industry's best animators making like a couple of cuts each and Freyrin can afford to have such an approach to his action because the action sequences I'm assuming are few and far in between. And as far as action sequences in 2023 goes, nothing even comes close to this other than the peaks of One Piece, especially the absurd nonsense that Hone Hone constructed that genuinely rivals Hakugo's work. But the difference being that action is necessary there because action is the name of the game there. Here it was more like the story just has an action sequence, so might as well go fucking all out. So the first three cuts here are animated by Norio school animators, first two by Keitsuro Watanabe and then by Shingo Yamashita. Keitsuro Watanabe does a bit of character acting here on this dragon and yeah, it moves so much. As I said, he's a practitioner of full animation. So in keyframes, you only need to animate the part that is moving. It's the part that remains still between frames don't need to have unique drawings. For example, in this cut, the only thing changing in Ghetto is his expression. And if you look at the production materials of that, the only thing that is animated is his expression which results in extremely funny shit like this. But when it comes to Keichiro Watanabe's animation, every single element of the dragon is moving in every single drawing. So no two keyframes will have anything similar. It's not just some kind of movement happening in every single drawing, it is everything moving at all times with every single drawing. All of these individual scales must have been so difficult to animate. He uses his own creativity to think about how a dragon would move. For example, while the dragon is prepping for this attack here, the scales on the back of its head, they stand up. So that is sort of like resembling the feathers on the back of a rooster standing up when it's angry. Taking ideas from our world and applying it into like fantasy worlds. That's how fun stuff is created. This cut again, absolutely classic Keichiro Watanabe effects. I thought really hard about who animated this because I couldn't tell if this was Kira or Shingo Yamashita because they both have extremely identical effects animation. As I said before, they are both Norio school animators. They both take massive inspiration from how Norio Matsumoto animates its effects. But now it does feel more like Kiro because of how floaty each layer feels. Like the steam here is supposed to be coming out of the dragon's mouth, but it feels like a completely separate layer. And when the dragon stomps on the ground, all the debris that pops up. It also looks like it's in a completely different layer. So that does give like a parallax effect because of the separation, but it also is extremely floaty. And I don't think Shingo Yama would do this. Shingo Yama would instead integrate all of the elements a little bit more seamlessly, but Kiro wants all of these elements to be as floaty as possible. The fireball and the ripple effect around it. Yeah, that's just gorgeous. Another reason why I thought this was Shingo Yama, aside from the similar animation techniques, is because of the comp. The compositing is completely different here, especially comparing it to the previous cut. Here, it looks like it's straight out of a Shingo Yama opening. Like the vignette applied, because you're darkening everything else, except the fireball, is absolutely something like Shingo Yama Shida would do. So I'm still thinking that this might have been comped by Shingo Yama. Because Keichiro Watanabe animating a red colored dragon with Shingo Yamashita on the compositing has happened before. This next cut here is of 
course entirely animated by Shingo Yamashita and it has all of the classic Yamashita shenanigans, the use of 3D reference, the hyper realistic body movements. It somewhat reminds me of the work that he did for Sakazume's pre-con episode and this portion specifically also reminds me of the panda sequence. So let's talk about the individual elements first. First of all, there's the character that he's animating absolutely flawlessly with realistic lifelike movements. Then there's the fireball and the impact with all the debris that's rising up. I can't tell how much of the background animation is 3D and how much of it is 2D for the like the terrain itself like this portion this dome right here right that looks like 2D textures slapped on top of a 3D model beyond a doubt 3D though are these elements in the background then the fireball lights up this area you can see properly yeah uh, look at this portion these are just rectangular 3D models and here again that's just a 3D cube these two platforms here they are just both 3D cubes even the smoke that rises in the background is 3D so the sparks and the debris they are definitely 2D but the smoke the rising in the background the white smoke that is 3d when you move past that and now it's rising up you can tell that it's 3d so yeah shingoyama usual integration of flawless 3d and 2d shingoyama's animation all these feels like it does not belong in tv anime cuts starting from here are animated by chris or yen bm this is also where you can really see toru ibazawa's understanding of scale like this kind of shit can only be storyboarded by someone who really understands action and can sell the scale of the action really well so starting up with a close-up of the dragon's face everything highly detailed here all the shadows on the scales animated so well then we zoom out but also rotating the dragon such a complex thing to do but Ian pulls it off easily but also continuing on the beautiful running animation and look at this little move that he does that is so cool bringing in the background and the foreground together as well by the background i just mean this model of the dragon because it's a big model you can't tell if it's big and far or big and close that is an illusion that animators have a very hard time conveying because everything is just 2d layers stacked on top of each other but yen conveys it brilliantly stark already does this little rotation motion here and it still feels like there's no interaction between the tail and stark but then the tail just seamlessly goes over stark so what's blending everything together what's blending the tail and the stark here it is the shadows as usual shadows are very important in shots like these so as soon as the approaching shadow over here is on top of stark you can tell that the tail is on top of stark as well because the tail is casting the shadow so the shadow also beautifully animated here just unites the two different elements in the animation flawlessly this is also still being rotated by the way genuinely incredible work gosh that's so good also utapon style smears everyone pretty much has utapon style smears at this point even animators who started off taking inspiration from other people have utapon style smears now tatsu yoshihara for example in fact a lot of people call this tatsu yoshihara smears like when toru animated this cut people first thought it was yoshihara because of the smears but toru is not copying yoshihara smears toru is copying utapon smears the spiky smears is something that utapon started something unique to yen though however the spikiness it's not very sharp it's a little bit more rounded this is something that he started using in one piece before he was exclusively spiky smear guy but with one piece specifically this zoro cut you can see that the spikiness of the smears are a little bit more rounded and yeah this kind of camera follow just something that Utapon always uses and Ian pulls it off flawlessly here flawless background animation combined with awesome smears on the smoke cubic debris oh what a surprise and when the smoke rises up first it's very high energy which is why it's spiky but then the energy dissipates and it just flows really well i'm sure i could have like utapon examples of the same thing as well so yeah continuous incredible debris and dust animation that looks really cool yeah uh, that's stark coming through the smoke yeah that's so cool he almost likes like a body of smoke with his head here he carries that smoke forward as well when he jumps through it tiny cool ideas executed to perfection is what makes an entire scene look amazing Starting from here, he's vertically running up the wall and yeah, that perspective animation is just so good. This is really complicated stuff to animate and every time Yen animates, it just shows you how much he's improved. It's honestly motivational. If anyone wants to try and become an animator, just follow Yen. Follow him on Patreon as well, you'll be able to learn a lot about animation there. Starting from here, animated by another superstar animator, Tatsuya Yoshihara. So Tatsuya Yoshihara started off as an animator inspired by Seiya Numata, who has a little bit more Kannada style approach to animation, but sometimes he also just goes ahead and animates literally everything in once like this character acting segment yoshihara is obviously known to emulate that in his style as well eventually a little bit more utapon also seeped into his style as it does with every animator of his generation the fluidity of the hair animation here is just absolutely wonderful I particularly love how the shadow comes in here or well the shadow goes away and the light comes in here when Freyren sees hope in Stark so like yeah right there my god yep that is entirely animated in once just when you think it's only about hair animation and he does that my god everything 2d there this entire zoom out 
in 2D with just absolutely flawless background animation and then the explosion itself. 3D FX shenanigans going on here as well because of course it's Yoshihara like the blur effect that he used here. I'm sure it was not added by the compositing, but Yoshihara himself. Again, I'm just blown away by the brilliance of this one cut. Like the different layers are just so well conveyed and the body language on Stark here as well. Yeah, just look at how he's just flipping in the air there. It's like there's an explosive force here, which is pushing him up. And where there are going to be students like Yenbian, there are of course going to be masters like Utapon. The first drawing that he made for this cut and already so much to talk about. Look at the shading of the background here. Why did he spend this much time intricately giving that background one, two, three, four different layers of shadows? Who does that? Utapon does that. Of course, it's not just a still drawing of a background. He animates that nonsense. It also has like an extreme level of three dimensionality, which obviously it does because he's animating four different layers of shadows. It's gonna have three dimensionality when you do that. And just the most classic Utapon camera movement. I can't even tell if this was really storyboarded by Toru Iwazawa or Utapon because, well, they both have the same style of storyboards as well. But I'd assume that this is Utapon storyboards as well because there's a cut coming later that I don't think anyone else could do. Coming down to the dragon here, look how well drawn that dragon is, how many layers of shadows there. So the kind of shit that Takio Ninuma and Sota Yamazaki do with their corrections, Yuta Kanakamura does in his animation with individual drawings. Look at this one drawing. That drawing lasts for a single frame, look at the level of detail here with the spiky smears, the black highlighting and the four lines to define his armpit, the muscle definition of his lats. It is so insane to me that he would do that for a single frame. I'm skipping single frames here while also still having that excruciating level of detail on the backgrounds, push the camera forward extremely quickly to then push past that. And now the camera goes underneath the fucking dragon, rotating the dragon vertically. And while rotating the dragon, Look at how, how much detail these two frames have. I think because Utapon is so good at animation, people forget his illustration skills. He's also one of the best illustrators in the business. You look at his still illustrations and the amount of detail that he can shove into one drawing is just beyond ridiculous. Really cool how the dragon has like sort of like a beard here, like in the blue portion is hairy and these mirrors are just goddamn perfect still. Again, how, how this one man have this good understanding of spacing? Look at the background, right? This is not how the background started off in this cut. So with the all the camera motion of us rotating the dragon's head like this to now look at the bottom portion, the background also rotated accordingly. The parallax effect in this particular cut is also extremely well done because of how good the layer defining is. So background, one, two, two different layers of the background and they're moving at different speeds. Then there's a dragon of course moving chaotically, but that's not all. To convey how fast the dragon is moving, another group of boulders placed very close to the camera so you can see them move past the camera very quickly there. Feel like I've seen something very similar in Yen's cut from One Piece. This is my favorite cut of the scene and I also think it's the most technically impressive one. And this is also why I said that I'm sure that this is storyboarded by Yutapon himself because only Utapon's twisted, action-oriented brain can come up with something this absurd. And cuts like these are truly what make Utapon who he is. How do you show that the dragon is moving its head really fast? By not animating the dragon's head at all. So he carried forth the dragon's head movement from the previous cut and the dragon's head is just vibrating. The idea of relative motion comes into play here. We can tell that movement is happening because of how chaotically the background is moving and how beautifully he's animated the character of Stark here. So every element of his body that can move, which is the clothing, the belt, and also the hair is moving as chaotically as possible, almost entirely animated in once, I think. Yeah, pretty much almost entirely animated in once, which is what Utapon usually does for fast chaotic sequences like this one. The background is a mix of twos and ones as well. And again, the same complicated shading on the background as well. Spiky wind smear animation that he usually does, again, for fast sequences such as this one. Even if we can't see the dragon moving its head, we can tell exactly in what direction it's moving its head, just from the way the hair and clothing is animated on Stark. Like his hair is of course gonna move in the opposite direction to which the dragon is moving its head. This scene is like the Bakugo escape scene combined with the Mission Impossible hanging out of the plane sequence. The shading here is just excellent. Shading on the hair and clothing to just define the depth in both is amazing. The star of the show is of course the shading on the dragon. He only has to draw the dragon one time but that could just be used as like a high detailed manga panel with how amazing it is. So on the dragon there's one, two, three levels of shading. On the scales and a similar number of shading one two three yeah three levels of shading inside the eye as well the dragon is also just menacingly looking at stark the entire time deep black shadows on the crevices as well Utapon, when it comes to his illustration it's like a mix of manga art meets western comics actually scratch the part where i said the dragon is not animated it is actually animated you can see the beard portion of the dragon yeah that's moving <laughs> 
and yeah that's the best cut of this incredible fight sequence next cut is also beautiful after watching the one piece sequences this just looks like just another cool cut because one piece has normalized large scale background animation to such an extent now particularly vincent chansat's works but of course utapon is like a pioneer of that as well he's been doing this since the 90s here the background is not animated in ones it's animated in twos but again three layers of shadows why why does there have to be three different shades for this boulder right here I mean, it does give it an incredible level of definition. You can tell that this is all because of Utapon's keyframe work as well, because structures like this one, they melt a lot because these are extremely hard to keep consistent while rotating or just changing perspective in general. Another Utapon quirk, start with something that does not make sense, but that eventually does make sense when the camera catches up or changes perspective. So here we were looking at the dragon's neck first and then the face. By the time the camera catches up, it's already like the classic Utapon wipe. And again, he's transferring the momentum so well. The dragon shook his head very violently, but then he just brings it to a dead halt. So of course, all that inertia is gonna throw Stark away. Every single cut is just so carefully thought out it's amazing also the way he's drawn stark here these are just absolutely classic nakamura illustrations freyden's characters have a little bit more rounded faces but utapon has given like the my hero academia nakamura jaw to this character make him look more cool and menacing and yeah the same thing is happening here as well uh he looks more like a my hero academia character than he does a freyden character love this one smear here uh that's actually not a smear i think that's a scale that's getting torn off so with this hand He's holding the portion where, you know, the axe is lodged. But with this hand, he was, I guess, clawing a scale. And that's where he loses. He actually didn't lose his grip because he's weak. It's because the dragon lost its scale. And of course, all that information is passed in a span of mere frames, not actually possible to see that in real speed but still that's such a good idea he innovates with anticipation here he, there's no build up and release the cut starts with the release and then technically eases out because the dragon's head is coming to a stop here but uh, the ease out is done extremely quickly extremely snappily so that he can transfer all that energy because he does not want to reduce the energy here that's what ease out is for right it's for reducing the energy what utapon wants to do here is is in a very snappy fashion transfer all that energy onto a different body and that's why it's so snappy and here again he's just animating such a large body so flawlessly with beautiful shading and the fire inside the dragon's mouth is just it does not get more classic utapon than this and i like how you can immediately tell from this single drawing you can tell that it's Hironori Tanaka. I've never seen Tanaka animate in like an extremely fast pace. He always gives ample time for his action sequences to flow. Really nice axe rotation here. The perspective is conveyed so flawlessly. He's an expert to a level that he knows his strengths very well. For example, complex perspective with a line of smoke just added for the sake of the satisfaction of the character passing through the line of smoke to add like smoke dissipation animation. So that's the kind of stuff that is probably not in the storyboards. Toru was our storyboards probably just said that Stark is just supposed to come close to the camera. And when Stark comes close to the camera, again, just completely ignoring what the character designs look like. Like this is not the round faced goofball that is Stark. This is a completely different badass looking character. And this close up is just crazy. Three layers of shading, one, two, and three. It's kind of difficult to spot because he also has a scar here, but it is three layers of shading. And of course, it's Tanaka, so the hair. Look at that hair, man. That is so good. The folds in the hair are just so well animated. Awesome storyboards in Ivazava's part. The eye transition to the dragon's eye. And you just see a shadow go past the dragon. That is Stark coming closer. And then just whoosh. Stark is literally pulling the dragon down out of the frame. Classic Tanaka's extremely fluid effects animation. It's like the time lapse of a bud blooming into a flower. Really nice control of the pace of the explosion. Very little snappiness. The shock is animated through like the ring. There is of course going to be build up and release, but the anticipation is very light. So here he's building up the explosion with this giant ball of smoke, which is then released with that flash of light and then just blooming into the actual explosion. But that's what I'm saying. Look at that. It's not as snappy as you would expect. That's because there are just, again, a large number of keyframes to Tanaka's animation. This portion is animating it in ones. And look at that smoke dissipation, man. The drawing work here is so complex. He's tried his level best to make it look as natural as possible. And look at the volume that it has, first of all. Like, you can tell that's a sphere 
of smoke right there. And even when it dissipates, you can tell that it is voluminous with just the dust cloud then emerging from the center. And yeah, just from here, you can tell that is Tanaka. Tanaka animates smoke as if it's like cloth. And that's it. That is the analysis of the fight scene between Stark and the dragon. I'm of course going to make another video on Freyrin talking about the overall style of the show. Other than that, I'll be talking about Freyrin again when it peaks. Which of course is going to be coming at some point, right? Because in the opening, there's like a chibi-esque demon lord kind of character who I'm assuming is going to be the main antagonist of the show. Even though the show is absolutely not about those themes. Like, similar comparison I can make to Freyrin is like Violet Evergarden. But yes, Violet Evergarden is not an action show. But when it did have some action sequences, it looked amazing. Also, the next episode of Jujutsu Kaisen is most likely going to be the best episode of the franchise so far. So, of course, I'm going to make a video on that as well. Apparently, participation by Takumi Sunokahara. So, yeah, super hyped for that. And yeah, that's about it. If you enjoyed this video, leave a like. If you did not like this video, leave a dislike. Subscribe and share, spread the love. And that's about it. Thanks for the views.